Nearly six months on from the riots in Dublin, uh, it's still being accused of being under-policed and full of ne'er-do-wells. Uh, this is from Mr Shakespeare, who's the new Dublin City Council CEO. Uh, is that the case? Well, uh, we are joined by two people who may have conflicting views or indeed may agree. Uh, I'm joined by Daniel McConnell, editor of the Business Post. He's on the line and in studio by Janet Horner, Green Party councillor for Dublin North Inner City. Good morning and welcome. Uh, Daniel, we'll go to you first because I, I know you're critical of the state that the capital is in. Good morning, Pat. Yeah, I, I mean, we've been writing quite extensively in the Business Post um, over many months about the state of Dublin City Centre. Um, I've been critical myself of the past around the, the state of the city in terms of the cleanliness, the, the safety of it. Um, I think it's it's well established now that and even the Garda Commissioner uh, Drew Harris has admitted that there's an under provision of policing uh, on, on the ground. You know, it's been a long standing criticism of the city that there isn't a visible Garda presence at, at busy times, at weekends, etc., when people are out socialising. Um, and I think, you know, the scars of, of the, the hollowing out of the city from COVID 19 are still very much there to be seen. Um, and when you when you combine all these factors together, a dirty city, an unsafe city, um, a city that's really kind of, you know, not really um, in good shape and, and is sort Sort of in a world of pain, and um, it, it's not a very uh, positive experience for those who are working in the city centre, visiting the city centre, or those who, like me, live close enough to the city centre and want to bring their kids uh, in, in and out of it. So, I think the comments from Richard Shakespeare um, are, are, I suppose, just reflecting that reality. He's obviously looking to set out his stall as the new man- manager of the city. Um, but what we need to see from the council and what we need to see from the Guardi is, is a huge stepping up of resources. We need to see the streets kept, even on a basic level, just kept clean, which they must certainly are not. Now, is it very different from pre-pandemic? I would certainly think that there was a noted difference and a noted impact of the of the COVID uh, pandemic when we saw shops closed and shops were boarded up. And there was definitely a kind of a shift in terms of those who were habiting and, and kind of um, on the streets throughout, throughout that pandemic. And obviously, I think the working from home issue uh, has changed the dynamic of who is in and occupying our streets at the moment. Um, but I think you know, there is that Garda, that, that deficiency in terms of Garda numbers and, and presence, and that obviously has a knock-on impact of those willingly. You know, as I've said before publicly, you know, you, you when you cycle through town, as I do pretty much every day, you know, you see open drug taking, you see open drug dealing, there's glass all over the streets, you see uh, ne- neglect is clear to see on our main thoroughfares, on the likes of Grafton Street, on the likes of uh, O'Connell Street and Henry Street, uh, and, and, and you know, we now see, you know, laneways are now being gated up or boarded up because they can't essentially be kept clean and they're not safe so you know there, 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 there seems to be a kind of a disconnect between you know those who are running the city and those who have responsibility for the city and those who are using it, the businesses the, the the citizens and the tourists and um, who are trying to because it's not a cheap location to come to dublin is an expensive city and um, but there is definitely a mis- mismatch there between how much we have to pay to enjoy the city and the state that it is in and i think there is as i said from a business perspective there's an awful lot more that needs to be done all right, Ed, Janet, uh, Green Party councillor for Dublin North Inner City. Um, you guys run the city. Yeah, and look, I mean, I would also be a, a strong critic of a lot of the issues that we see in the city. And I'm like, you know, spend a lot of my days involved in, in meetings and structures to try and impact on that and try and do something positive for the city. So I do know there's a lot of people um, engaged in goodwill out there, but I think like I, I do see the problems we all, we all do on a daily basis in here. I get so frustrated by the issues of dereliction, the, the, the lack of sort of proper youth services around. In my area in Dublin 1, we see a huge concentration of emergency accommodation, for example, without necessarily the wraparound structures in place to support that. So, I mean, I am very optimistic for the city. I think we have an incredible city in front of us and one that has, has huge opportunity okay, those but of us that if live you address, here. If you address the problems that Danny talks about, on a basic level, litter, litter everywhere. Um, and we know that when it was decided by the City Council that refuse would be contracted out because people were going to be asked to pay for refuse. Back in the day, there used to be rates and the rates allowed Dublin City Council to collect the stuff. And we always knew there would be people who tried to game the system if they had to pay. They would not pay, so they just dump their stuff wherever they could. Um, sometimes there's no joint up thinking. 
I, like, and I think this is, I think a holistic approach to engaging with the problems of the city is what we need. I think the city council has operated in sort of silos, not just the council itself from other departments, but also within the council, you've got waste management doing one thing, housing doing another thing, um, homeless accommodation doing another thing. And they're sometimes pulling in different directions. So we, we 100% do need a much more holistic approach to how we are planning to solve the issues of the city centre. Um, I, I think the issue of waste there is a huge one. In my area, we declared a litter emergency. I, I passed a motion on it about back in September. Since then, we've tried to have working groups on it. We've tried to do things a bit differently. We're looking at changes to primary legislation on it. Like, I, what we do need to, it's not just litter alone is not going to solve the no, issues no, I, of the I, city. I said we take one thing at a time. The litter for example, when I came in this morning along Stephen Street, uh, there were uh, there was refuse everywhere. Now, whether the seagulls or the foxes were responsible, uh, to me, there's something lo- wrong with the rules because, you know, you know that stuff should be almost picked up at two o'clock in the morning before the seagulls get going on it. It shouldn't be allowed to to be there to give them a chance. Like there, there can be rules imposed. It might be uh, discommoding for those who run those trucks. Sorry, too bad. We need to keep our city clean. Yeah, and I think, I mean, litter is definitely, it is one thing I think we do need to be a lot more ambitious about. Um, I think we need to, we've got used to seeing businesses pile up bags and bags and bags, taking up sometimes half the footpath in the evenings yeah. when you're, if you're walking down Westmoreland Street, you're trying to get on the bus, you're navigating puddles of water, a lot of people waiting for buses and piles of, of rubbish that have been put out by the businesses. These solutions, we do need to look at bigger solutions. Those bigger solutions take investment. We, I think a lot of the time in the City Council, we are stuck trying to solve things on the lowest possible budget rung, which sometimes just doesn't get us the results we need. I think we need to be willing to invest. And again, this is one issue of litter. We need to be willing to invest there, but we need to be willing to not just look at throwing 10 grand towards the youth club in the North Inner City. And we need to be saying, how do we take a, a multi-state agency, multi-million euro approach, recognise that our capital city needs You, you swear you were looking to be elected. Investment. You've already been elected, Janet. You, you know, you're saying we must do this. Why aren't you doing it? Well, I, you know if I mean? you're going to put and, a... and you've got Eamon Ryan's ear, who who is the third uh, leg of the stu- the third leg of the stool of government. Um, so, so if you need changes, you you've got a, a voice at the highest table. Yeah, and look, Pat, and uh, like you know, again, thank you for assuming that I have the power to change everything in the city single handedly. Unfortunately, that's not the reality of being a city councillor. Um, I we need much more serious. Um, engagement from, for example, the, the Minister for Justice on getting things like we've had the Community Safety Partnership. We've talked about that on, on here before, which the Minister for Justice has rolled out and talked about every time that we have had seen issues of violence and, and well, what is poor that? conduct. What is the Community Safety Partnership? It's supposed to be a multi-state agency approach to dealing with issues of safety and ensuring the community members have ownership of safety in their own area in the North Inner City. In reality, it is under-resourced, it lacks a seniority, and it, it, mm. but it is discussed by the minister every time. These are the kind of things that I want to see properly resourced, properly supported, not just by the likes of me, who is a city councillor, who I will say I'm banging my head off a brick wall on a daily basis, trying to get things done on these kind of issues, but at the highest possible level, as you say, at the level of ministers, at the level of departments. And the council, the the issues of the council need serious investment. I unfortunately don't have my fingers on the purse strings of multi-million euro investment that the city needs at this point in order to live up to its potential because it is an amazing city. Drug dealing on the streets, open drug dealing in the middle of the day. Again, the policing has a very strong role to play in this. Uh, uh, Richard Shakespeare says that they have great relations with the Gardaí. Well, if you have, why isn't policing better? Policing plays a role, but there are other solutions that we need. We need to be dealing with addiction much better as no, a city no, no, as a no, whole. No. When I am going through the city and I see open drug dealing and I see panhandling and all of that, the first thing you do is stop that. You know, stop the open drug dealing. I don't know where you move it to. Do you have to have your, your injection centres? But it is unacceptable that, uh, you know, the, at the very genesis of the state, outside the GPO, you've got people drug dealing. Come on. No, I agree. I 100% agree with that. I think what I, all I am saying is that the solutions to that is a little bit more complex. There isn't a silver bullet available to us that just says, 
we can just get rid of it. We can just flick a switch or or invoke one state agency to get rid of it. We need safe injecting centres. We need serious investment in mental health. We need serious investment in our youth services. We need serious investment in our Gardaí in order to have better policing solutions. But that is a much broader, more rounded range of solutions. And that is long-term investment, okay. long-term we vision. We have thinking. been banging on about the need for a playing field in Dublin 8. And we've invited Richard Shakespeare, the aforementioned, uh, to come in several times. He's refused. Um, and, you know, what do you expect when you give kids no outlet for their recreation? What do you expect? I've, we've been saying again and again, being a member of a team is better than being a member of a gang. But it's fallen on deaf ears in Dublin City Council. And the minister pointed the finger directly at Dublin City Council and said it is within their remit. Not his, the Minister for Sport. It's Dublin City Council's job. And Richard Shakespeare refuses to engage with us on it. I... I, I agree again, Pat. I don't. I'm not disagreeing with anything you're saying here. Like I have worked very a lot with a lot of our local clubs in our area, Eastwell, Bessborough. We're trying to get secure a uh, pitch for them in the area. The same issues in Fairview Park. We've seen the pitches destroyed a few times over the last number of months by um, vandals in the at n- late at night, and it's left the pitches unplayable for young people. Uh, these are really important avenues and outlets for people, young people to see their potential, to have a stake in their community, to feel that they're part of something bigger than themselves and not feel such a sense of dissatisfaction and anger that they are engaged in in Mm. vandalism and antisocial behaviour within their own communities. Danny, what do you say in response to Janet? Yeah, I think, you know, because again, Pat, I probably was on your show last year when we wrote about this previously and you know, was in talking to the likes of Hazel Chew and others. You know, there's a lot of hand-wringing from, from councillors. There's a lot of sort of, if, if only we could do something about it. You know, it, it's kind of frustrating to hear that, you know, things aren't changing, that there isn't the will or the ability to try and, and fix even some of the smaller problems, like you say, the litter. I can't see how it's that difficult to reallocate the resources that are, exist within the Dublin City Council to make sure that litter is collected at the right time and the streets are kept clean. We see, in fairness to Dublin City Council, they're obviously taking a proactive approach in terms of their social media in highlighting when streets are being air, air washed and, and kind of cleaned up. Like, I lived in New Orleans um, and I worked on Bourbon Street, which is kind of party central. Like, the streets were cleaned literally every morning. Like, there was a, you know, there was a coordinated attempt by the city to make sure that the businesses could get the, 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 the right to sell alcohol and, and kind of trade. And then there was a recognition that the businesses and the city had to clean up every morning. So by 11 o'clock every morning, Bourbon Street was spotless again and it would and the and the thing would go again. I can't understand why Dublin, which trades on its uh, on our tourism brand, obviously Temple Bar and, and other areas are huge attractions for tours, but yet there's no doesn't seem to be any coordination when it comes to making sure that the streets are, are clean properly. Um and ultimately again we're just reflecting now, the, the it the, may the, be, the, the by the way, Danny, in, in fairness to them, I'm out and about early, so I see this stuff. Perhaps, you know, at seven thirty or eight o'clock they clean up this stuff. But certainly before seven o'clock in the morning, the litter's all over the place and you can blame the seagulls. uh, But, you know, there's got to be a better way. There has to be a better way, but also as well, I mean, I do accept as well that people have responsibility to kind of not not trash the city that they're going to. But I mean, when you've got large crowds, messes tend to happen. We see it at concerts, we see it at matches, we see it at big big gatherings. So, you know, there is a kind of an onus on the city that if we are going to promote outdoor living and space and kind of eating and and drinking outside, that there needs to be the support structures there to actually make it it viable. But on a more fundamental level, Pat, I think your, your point is well made in terms of why can't we just keep one the city clean and why can't we keep the city safe? And they're the two big questions. I think if we could make progress on that, I think you'd see a much better trading environment for businesses. I think people would look to come into the city and shop a little bit more. And three, I yeah. think Dublin there's, would actually there's be a an, another option. element here, uh, Danny, and that is, you know, when we hear of Guardia uh, at the time of the riot, afraid to take action because they might end up in front of GSOC. Do you know? Yeah, I, I mean, either we get serious about proper policing, put the fear of God in the obs. They certainly have no fear of a guard, whatever about the fear of God. They certainly don't. And I think, you know, I think that feeling or that trepidation being felt by individual officers about actually kind of going in heavy, essentially, on on the rioters, you know, is bred from the fact that there is this onerous kind of watchdog system in place. Now, for good reason, yeah, GSOC is there for good reason, given previous kind of scandals in in Angardi Shiakona. But there is a balance. You know, the guards need to be able to police their streets and they need to be able to keep law and order. If you go to Paris, you go to London, you go to Berlin, you will see a robust police presence when you're out socialising. And, you know, there isn't that sort of um, 
I, I don't think I never get the sense when I'm when I'm abroad that you would mess with the police because you know you'd get short thrift. I don't necessarily think that there's that level of fear mm. or even that that sense of respect uh, for our members of Garda Shia Connor. The riots was a clearly a very I think it was a disgusting episode in our in our in our um, capital's history, and um, but the, clearly there was opportunistic looting, there was opportunistic violence, um, which which was sparked from an earlier incident. But you know there are more fundamental issues. I get that this is not a, a, an easy fix. I get that these are complex issues, but I do think if if Dublin City Council and then Garda Shia Connor can even start making progress on one or two of the key areas, I think that would make a dramatic mm. improvement. To, I read to the you of Dublin, uh, uh, some of the comments. Uh, three times in the last month, I've left Trinity in the evening walking towards CHQ to the Cube car park. Each time I've had to retreat and walk the long way up Pier Street, down past Mulligan's because at the bottom of Lombard Street it's full of youths chasing delivery drivers and blocking off pedestrians at that bridge across from CHQ. The inner city is a kip, so much for an increased guard the presence. And it seems to me if that's a habitual carry-on, why aren't the Gardaí there? Because they must know about it. Uh, agree 100% with Danny, uh, the state of Dublin. Huge deterioration during and since lockdown. Dirty and dangerous. Worse from the Liffey up to Parnell Square. Many won't go into shop or theatre anymore. I visit other cities and wish my city could be as clean and safe. That's Maria Nurhini. Talking to two Canadians at the airport, they said they never felt safe in Dublin and that it was so dirty and so many gangs of feral youths. No police presence, etc. They said they would visit Cork and Galway faster, but they'll be telling all their friends, do not come to Dublin. That says it all. We had a lovely meal and drinks in Stony Batter on Easter Sunday. We did note some ugly fly tipping of household waste in side streets and around litter bins. This is a very basic hygiene requirement for any city. Just revert to paying for waste collection from central taxation and spare us the embarrassment of looking at this awful litter. We were in Slovenia last June at the height of the tourist season. Zero litter everywhere. That's from Kieran in Rathfarnham. Uh, Dublin is a kip. It's filthy. It's intimidating day and night. It's overpriced. It's one of the worst cities I've ever been to. And I'm a dub. Just back from a city break to Riga. Clean, safe, day and night, well-priced, a joy to visit. I would never recommend Dublin to anyone when there are so many more beautiful, safer, cleaner cities around Europe. In Portugal, shop owners put their rubbish into underground silos uh, from on-street bins. Could we not put some of these on Dublin's shopping streets and use CCTV to catch anybody who should not be using them? That's from John. I visited Dublin for the first time in four months last Thursday. Refuse everywhere, tents on every corner, open drug dealing on the quays, not a Garda in sight. Please save our capital city. I worked in Dublin for 40 years just off Dame Street. I rarely go into town now so I don't feel safe. Last time I was in the, in, the streets were filthy, drug dealing openly going on. I'd never use my mobile on the street as I'm afraid it will be stolen. Such a change from other European cities which are clean and safe. And a final one which I'll put to Janet. Uh, what's the point in electing councillors when obviously they can't achieve anything? Whenever you ask them to stop something like open drug dealing, they change the subject to social issues and have no solution to stop it. And that's what you did, Janet. You say we need this, that and the other, long-term education, rehabilitation, da-da-da. Meantime, every single day, the drug dealing goes on. What I am saying is that we've been let down consistently by people saying that there's silver bullets and easy solutions to this. We need politicians to stop standing up and saying, oh, I can solve, like, drug dealing, easy to solve. We're just going to go and get, like, bring in more Agardi. That is not going to solve it. What I'm saying is we need politicians to be realistic about the scale of the issues, get serious about them, and to engage in the hard work that is necessary to solve the structural issues rather than offering salves, bombs, fronts, easy solutions that won't work and continue to let the city down. And that's what I'm offering. I'm saying I'm here trying to do the hard work of these things okay, rather uh, than I know that, l- uh, offer silver Dublin bullets city that Council, won't work. You know, it's not like uh, the, the mayor of New York who decided uh, on zero tolerance and there's a relationship between the mayor of New York and the head of the, the NYPD. Here, uh, Drew Harris is uh, head of the National Guard Force and you've got the CEO, uh, Richard Shakespeare of Dumb City Council, who might be pals, uh, you know, with him, but there's no, if you like, in- intersection of their powers. So, you know, you really don't have much to control, but you do have control over litter. That is part of your job. Rates are paid and the streets have got to be kept clean. If we had a much more empowered 
city council and much more decentralised structures in Dublin, in, in Ireland as a whole, we would see a lot more powers and actions taking place in city council. And that is something that I would really like to see. I would love to see a directly elected mayor for Dublin so that we can drive forward vision and have power at a slightly higher level than the city council does at the moment. These are things we definitely need. We need to be pushing forward for for Dublin. Um, but in the meantime, things like litter are things we do need to get serious about. I am I am working on that day and night at the moment, like it is part of the the bread and butter of what I'm doing. Um, but it it is going to take a lot more than me. It is going to take a lot more than than just a sort of a singular working group for us to to change what we see as a continuous, frustrating, undignified, unsafe situation when it comes to the amount of litter that is on our streets. Uh, oh, if we okay. are taking now, that now singular Richard, issue, Richard Shakespeare has talked the talk about the ne'er do well. So now he's got to walk the walk. So we'll see uh, what he does because other people are blam- blaming previous CEOs and how there was uh, a lot of neglect. But um, one texter says, "Start with the litter." and the streets. Dublin City Council has a budget of 1.8 billion. Well, in fact, the operational day-to-day budget is 1.34 billion, which is a hell of a lot of money. Now, that pays for things like street lighting and uh, all the rest and the maintenance of pavements and so on. But it's a lot of money, 1.34 billion. Uh, Our current councillors have a lot to answer for and should be challenged on the doorsteps as they canvass for the upcoming local elections. Another one, I met with a number of relatives on Easter Sunday. We all had our stories about seeing open drug dealing in Dublin City Centre. I had seen it from our trip on the Viking Splash Tour last year while stopped stopped at traffic lights. No sign of any guards. None of us go to Dublin as much anymore unless we need to and we only live an hour away. Such a pity to see the city like this. Where is the leadership? Danny, your final comments. Yeah, I, I again, Pat, I, just, I, I listened to, to uh, Janet uh, talk about there and I do empathise on an individual level to councillors, but I, I, I think you know, we're heading into local and European elections. I think you know, the, it, it's an opportunity for, I suppose, the citizenry of Dublin to kind of force action from those seeking re-election that you know, maybe don't come looking and promising us a 15% reduction in, in our property tax. Spe- keep the money and keep the streets clean would be my argument to, to them. Um, but uh, you know, we've often seen parties, you know, bigger parties go the populist route and say, yes, no, we'll give you a reduction in your property tax. I'd rather them keep the money at this stage and make the streets clean and make the streets safe. And um, so I would think there's an opportunity here heading into the local elections for that to happen. Let's see. Mm. But as you say, Richard Shakespeare has a, has a big job of work ahead of him. Yeah. And finally, uh, to you, Janet, I mean, what can councillors do? I mean, you might pass a motion for this, that and the other, but it it's the executive who c- would carry out your wishes. Or can you do that? Can you instruct the executive as city councillors to do something. I think more than instruct that, I think we need to be leading with the vision piece. I think that there is like, no, no, you know, no, we've no, talked no, about that this. Was a straightforward question. Could you pass a motion that instructs the city council to do certain things as councillors? Because if it's democracy, that's what should happen. There, can you do it? There can is a mechanism it? that you can do, but if you want to be effective, I would not recommend those mechanisms. I would recommend doing the hard work, working with people rather than sort of issuing instructions without actually engaging with what the issues are that the council is trying to take But you do on. have the power to pass motions to instruct the executive to do certain things. But if we instruct them, say you're going to clean up litter in the morning, what is that going to do? Like, do they have the do they have the the resources? Do they have the the manpower? Do they have any of these kind of things? You can't instruct people to do what they don't have the resources to do at the time. So, yeah, well, we can't pass to instructions. divert resources from other activities. Maybe I don't know. Uh, anyway, you have the power to do it, but you never do it. You never tell them what to do. They are a law unto themselves. The executive. The executive. There is a there is an issue in Irish local government where executives hold a lot more power than councillors do would typically do in other jurisdictions in other cities. That is definitely the case in Dublin. Um, But I I think that, again, if we're talking about trying to do meaningful work, you can do a lot more meaningful work than what I think is is beyond just sort of passing a motion, for example. So confrontation, not the way. With it's the executive, in it, not in every situation. I think it is a, a, it is limited utility, and we should be careful about how we use it. Janet, thank you very much for joining us. Janet Horner, Green Party councillor for Dublin North Inner City. Thank, I, I mean, you're great to come up and you know face the music, as it were. Uh, many councillors would not be prepared to so do, and uh, Richard Shakespeare clearly not prepared to so do. Uh, but anyway, thank you uh, for joining us, and uh, Daniel McConnell, editor of the Business Post. Uh, thank you also very much.